Well, this is the eighth in a series of messages from Billy Graham's book, Peace with God. We've just taken the title, and really we've developed our own messages out of them. Of course, we'll take a break. We have two more that will conclude uh, this series, but uh, we will pass our Lenten time and Good Friday and uh, Resurrection Sunday, and then we'll have those other two. Well, let's talk about temptation. First of all, if we're going to talk about dealing with temptation, we have to really define what it is. What is temptation? What is temptation? Uh, is it that extra cookie from the cookie jar or that a nice chocolate cream pie that you had two pieces of already and you're thinking about a third one? Well, perhaps, but temptation is a lot broader too. What is temptation? Well, temptation is seduction to evil. Solicitation to wrong. It stands distinguished from trials. Trials are tests seeking to discover man's moral qualities or character. And sometimes God does test us. He does try us to bring out those moral qualities or character. But temptation is different. Temptation persuades to evil. Temptation deludes that it may ruin you. The one means to undeceive and the other means to deceive. Okay, trial means, when we're put under trial, to undeceive us and help us truly see right from wrong, but the other temptation means to actually deceive us. One aims at man's good, making him conscious of his true moral self. The other at evil, leading him more or less unconsciously into sin. God tries, Satan tempts. God tries us, but Satan tempts us. Now, there are misunderstandings about temptation, and it's good to clear them up. And I've fallen under one or two of these as well as I think about it. Number one, temptation itself is sin. That's a lie. Some people believe that when you're tempted, you've sinned. Temptation in itself is not sin. Or we fall into temptation. Uh, that is not so. You say, well, I don't know how it happened. I just fell into it. Uh, chances are you made a decision along the way. We really just don't fall into temptation. God is disappointed and displeased when we are tempted. False. God is not displeased and disappointed when we are tempted. Once again, temptation is not sin. To be strongly tempted means we are guilty as if we have actually committed sin. Now, many feel that way. If they're strongly tempted about something, really get into this temptation, but don't yield to it is just like they've actually committed that sin. False. Being strongly tempted does not mean we are guilty as if we've actually committed that sin. Also, we overcome all temptation by separation from it. False. That's not true. Indeed, that might limit your temptation, but we have temptation within us, and we carry it within us from our fleshly nature. So separation from temptation doesn't mean from all temptation. Also, finally, when I am spiritually mature, I will no longer be harassed by temptation. False. When you are spiritually mature, yes, you will still have temptation and be harassed from time to time. That was taken by Charles Stanley in In Touch, and a great list really to think about. Temptation is a serious thing, and we don't toy with it. We don't toy with pet sins because pet sins eventually may kill us. Children grow up with teddy bears and often figure that since the toys are cuddly, the real things might also be cuddly as well. In 1990, two boys scaled the fence at the Bronx Zoo in New York City and went in the polar bear compound. The next day, they were both found dead. Your pet sin can kill you. So it's good to remember sin does destroy, sin does affect us. Now, how do we meet temptation? That's what we want to know. How do we meet it? 
and we're talking about this morning. Well, let me give you some principles from Scripture, some teachings. First of all, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This is very important, mom, dad, young man, young woman. 1 Corinthians 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits or bad morals, or good morals. Evil company corrupts good morals or bad habits. I'm telling you, dear friends, we've got to do something about the people we hang out with. Do you know who your children hang out with? Do you know who they associate with? Who do you spend time with in the workplace? We eventually become like them. We eventually pick up their ways. We need to separate ourselves from evil company. Now, it's true, we work around them. We know that in the workplace and so on in the neighborhood. But I'm talking about spending time with them on our own, desiring to spend time with them. Isn't it a shame that many people, it seems, in the church would rather hang out with their unsafe friends than believers? There's something very wrong about that. It says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. It will affect you. It will affect your children. You open yourself to all kinds of temptation when you're with evil company. It is there. And when you're there with them, they want you to do what they do. It's just normal. It's just natural. They want you to do the same thing. So that might be coming down to the bar for a while or maybe taking a little bit of this or that. Dear friends, it tells us, do not be deceived. Don't say, oh, I'll be okay. Don't worry, I'm not to handle myself. You will be affected. It's just a matter of time. So bad company corrupts good habits good morals. Stay away from bad company. God tells us, don't be deceived by this. I'm telling you, don't be deceived. It will happen. You know, putting it this way, what settings are you in when you fall? When a person falls into temptation, what settings are you in? Well, avoid those settings. What props do you have that support your sin? What props do you have that support your sin? Eliminate the props. What people are you usually with? Avoid them. There are two equally damning lies Satan wants us to believe. Number one, oh, just once won't hurt. Number two, that when you've ruined your life, you are beyond God's use, so you might as well enjoy and go on sinning. Learn to say no, it'll be of more use to you than being able to read Latin, says Charles Spurgeon. We've got to learn to say no and say it firmly. How to meet temptation? Have a consistent, constant prayer life. Let prayer be a way of life. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Have that mindset of prayer always ready so when temptation comes along, you're able to pray. It comes as natural as breathing, that prayer life. How to meet temptation? Our thought life is very important. Where do our thoughts wander during the course of a day? Philippians 4, 8, as Paul writes to the church of Philippi, says it well. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate upon these things, dwell upon these things, think upon these things. Our thought life can open the door of all sorts of temptation for us if our thoughts are in the wrong place. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart, that is keep your mind with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. What are you thinking about? What do you let your mind wander? Dear friends, that will make a difference in temptation and how to resist it. Our thought life is so, so important. Furthermore, the scripture tells us, draw near to God, James 4, 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God is more than willing to want to draw near to you, but he wants us to move towards him first. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's the promise. You say, well, God seemed far away in temptation. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. I seem so helpless and so weak. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. We have his promise. Being near to God strengthens us 
to meet temptation. How do we meet temptation? First of all, we want to make this clear. And James 1.13 tells us, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God never tempts us. Remember we said he tries us, he tests us for our good, to bring out our character, to develop us, but he never solicits us to do evil. For he cannot, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. He tests us to prove us, but he cannot tempt us to do evil. Keep that in mind. Very important to realize that, that God never solicits us, he never tempts us to do evil. As you look at your life today as a believer, are there any openings in your life where Satan could get in? Any weak areas? In Old Testament times, they would fortify the walls or build up the walls, but if there was a little opening where the enemy could get in, the enemy would get in through that opening. So the walls around your life, your walk with Christ, is there an area that's weak? Is there an area where the enemy might come in? Now, you know where it is in your life, and I know where it is in my life. Well, maybe this area is not so good in that area. Fine. The enemy will find it and will tempt you in and through that area. One day, little Richard was told by his mother to come straight home after school and not stop at the baseball field. After school, Richard decided to carry his ball and glove with him just in case he was tempted. Dear friends, we set ourselves up for temptation when we leave areas in our life unattended, when part of that wall is down. We're like this young man who is really opening the door for temptation. How do we close it? Well, put on Christ as the scripture says. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says it so well. It says, and do, and do this knowing that the time is now high time to awake out of our sleep. Christian, let's awake. We see the war we're in. Let's wake up. For now our salvation is nearer to us than we first believed. And it is true. Christ could come at any time. Christ could come at any time. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I love that. So if there's any area in our life that's darkness, and we know it's darkness, we know it's not right, let's cast it off. Let's cast it off and put on the armor of light. Then it says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverie, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and en envy. And then it tells us exactly by doing this, we'll put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Dear friends, when there are openings in that wall that surrounds your life, then we leave an area for the enemy to get in. Let's put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Build up those weak areas in our life because that's where the enemy will attack. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Another area that is a problem uh, with many, many Christians is the world. The world out there, the world in this allurement is very attractive. You know, John Piper says that sin, lust for example, gets his power by persuading me to believe I will be more happy if I follow it. The power of all temptation is the prospect that it will make me happier. Think about that. When we're tempted, and we talk with temptation, the idea that's implicit there is that somehow, if I do this, I will be happier. Dear friends, all that glistens is not gold. The devil appears as an angel of light, and we might uh, satisfy that appetite for the moment, but boy, it lets us down quickly, and we are saddened, often leaves us in depression, and we say, how could I have ever fallen for this? It's amazing. A cartoon in the New Yorker magazine showed some pigs at the feed trough. As a farmer filled the trough with food, one hog asked the others, have you ever wondered why he's so good to us? When Satan tempts people, he's like the farmer 
fattening up the pigs for the slaughter. Temptation looks appealing at first, but it always drags its victims into misery, bondage, and heartbreak. Dear friends, when you are tempted, it looks so good. And when you fall for it and fall for it again, Satan is fattening you up for the slaughter. Don't fall for it. How to meet temptation? Well, we said don't love the world, but rather love the will of God. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, it tells us this. Do not love the world. That is the world system, the evil, the greed, the avarice, the pride, the power. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, it says, is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the greedy longings of the mind, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the a Father, but is of the world. And here's one thing to remember about this world that glitters and glistens. Remember, the devil offered it to Jesus. As he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, he said to Jesus, the chutzpah of this guy, he said, all these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. He showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. It must have been very, very alluring, I think. But you know what? Verse 17 of this text, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, says this, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Isn't that great? To know, hey, dear friends, don't fall for the world. This world is passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. We live on and on. Don't fall for the world. There was one with the Apostle Paul who fell for the world. His name was Demas. And in 2 Timothy 4.10, it says of Demas, who was with Paul, for Demas, having forsaken me, having loved this present world, has departed for Thessalonica. It doesn't break your heart when you see a brother or a sister just go out into the world and get lost into the world. Oh, it really causes concern. We've got to, we've got to guard ourselves, make sure. How to meet temptation. James 4, 7 is a great scripture that tells us how to do that. James 4, 7, three words, really. Submit, resist. It says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We submit to God. That's number one. See, the devil's not afraid of us, but when we submit to God, he sees God's in us, God in us. Remember that little girl illustration? When the devil comes knocking at my door, the little girl said, I always send Jesus to answer the door. That's what he's afraid of, that Jesus is going to answer the door when he comes around. Therefore, we submit to God. We say, yes, Lord, I'm surrendered to you. I'm going to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. When the devil sees that, he can't take it. Then resist the devil. Say no to him in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will flee from you. Submit, resist, he will flee. How to meet temptation? Yes, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Great words there. Be sober. Now, it doesn't just mean don't get drunk. It's talking about being self-disciplined. It's talking about think rationally and not foolishly. We're to be sober today. We're to be sober today. And a lot of Christians are not serious enough. Uh, I don't mean to be sour-faced or serious. We should be rejoicing and happy in the Lord. But take things seriously. We can't be flippant. We should be serious about what's going on. Be self-disciplined. Think rationally, not foolishly. And then it gives us another word in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. Be vigilant. That means be spiritually alert of the pitfalls of life and take appropriate steps to make certain that you do not fall into them. So you and I are called to be sober. We're called to be vigilant. And then it says in verse 9, resist him. Resist him. We've submitted to God already, right? So we're going to be sober. We're going to be vigilant. We're going to resist him. We're going to be alert. As we do this, he will flee. He will flee. In this case, in 1 Peter 5, when we are met with Satan, we're resisted not to flee, but to resist him, to stand and resist him. Victory comes when we remain committed to God. However, when we talk about sexual temptation, another methodology in the Word of God is to flee 
immorality, to flee immorality. And we know, we see that with Joseph, right? When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and he didn't uh, sit down, have a cup of coffee, take out the cake and say, well, let's talk about this. No, he took off. I mean, he took off. She grabbed onto his garment. He left it behind. He didn't say, I want to go back and get my coat. Forget it. He left it there. He just fled. A couple of boys tried to walk through a corral when a bull saw them and began to charge. One boy said, let's stop and pray. The other boy said, no, let's run and pray. They didn't need to resist the bull inside the corral. They needed to run out of the area where they were vulnerable. That's what we need to do when we're tempted. We need to flee from temptation. And we see this. 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, flee sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. And dear friends, that is a big thing today for uh, men, women, children. Sexual immorality is like, like it's like all over the place. All over the place. No matter where you go, it's all over. So we've got to be equipped to flee from it. You know, someone has talked about forbidden fruit, mm, right? It's hard to pick forbidden fruit if you're 100 yards away, but easy if you're an arm's length away. Stay away from the forbidden fruit. How to meet temptation? Well, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us how to do that. Give our body and mind to God. Give our body and mind to God. I like Romans 6, and the earlier part of it is we used to yield our members, our eyes, our, our mouth, our hands, our feet to sin before we were saved. But now we take our same members and we yield those members now to righteousness. And, you know, I like to say a practical thing to do is, you know, we get up in our morning, we surrender to the Lord, I give these hands to you today to serve you. I give these eyes to you today to see things that are pleasing to you. I give these ears today to listen to things that are pleasing to you. I give these feet today to only be in places that would give you honor. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies but it says a living sacrifice, not like the dead ones that they offered up the Old Testament. I'm a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. And then it says, for our mind, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How am I transformed? By the renewing of my mind in the word of God, in prayer, that you may prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Have we given God our body and our mind? Have we surrendered that to him? That will help us enormously deal with temptations that come our way. How to meet temptation? Well, we go to Christ for help. That's what we've been saying. I love these verses in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us, with our weaknesses, but in all points has been tempted just like we are yet without sin. Christ knows about temptation. Christ was tempted like we were. So he sympathizes with us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's always ready and willing to help us. We can come there. Hebrews 2.18 says this as well. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to help those who are tempted. Jesus can identify with what you're going through. If you are really tried and tempted and struggling in temptation, Jesus can identify with that. And he wants to help you. He wants to aid you. He wants to bring you through. Let's come to that throne of grace to find help in time of need. Another area in the Word of God that talks about how to deal with it is Psalm 119.11. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we spend time in God's word. We memorize it. We meditate upon it. We treasure it up uh, in our, our self. We share it. We live it out in our lives. Your word have I. I can't stress, boy, in this day and age in which we live, get into this book. Get into God's word. Really spend good time in it. Let it get into you. You get into it. Then live it out in your life. Share it with a friend. God's word is what it's all about. And it will help us 
to resist temptation in a powerful way. Well, some encouragements. First of all, the encouragement I have is Romans 8.31, when he talks about that we were selected, we were predestined. God has done all of these things. It's a done deal for every believer. It says, what shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? Realize that God is for you. Realize that God is for you. No matter what you're going through, God is for me. God is for you. And boy, when you take hold of that thought, if you have God for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. It doesn't matter who's against you because they really can't win. Number one, God is for you. Another encouraging thought that God is faithful. God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able to handle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a great passage. It says, no temptation, no trial of temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it, to endure it. Isn't that good to know? That God is faithful. And he won't give you any more than you can handle. Any more. He knows that cutting off point. He knows where you say, I can't handle any more. God knows what that point is. And he won't give you any more than you can handle. So God is faithful. God is faithful. God is for us. And he won't give us more than we can handle. And I love the words of Jesus when I think about temptation. Because oftentimes when we are tempted and they seem strongest to us is when we feel weary, worn, beat down, discouraged, just. And that's, boy, when the tempter comes around in those times, he seems to do damage. And what does Jesus say in those times? He says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You have all the burdens of the world upon you. You are just so discouraged. This happened and that happened today. And I've just had it. Oh, boy, sometimes we go into a pity party and all this, oh, poor me and, and stuff like this. But Jesus said, You come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is right. So come, learn, rest, give him your burden. I love those words. Come, learn, rest, and give him your burden. And he'll fortify you, he'll strengthen you, so you won't be an open target for the evil one. Open target. So when I think about also in encouragement, this is a verse, maybe you wouldn't think of an encouragement, but first, uh, excuse me, uh, James 1, verses 2 through uh, 4, where he says, my brethren, count it all joy. When you go through various trials, you say, <laughs> uh, how can I count it all joy when I go through various trials? Well, there's a purpose behind this. This is the trying part of God. Trying us, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, patience, perseverance. But let that patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, that is mature and complete in everything. Dear friends, you won't be lacking in everything. God wants to build us up. When he tries us and he tests us, he wants to grow us, he wants to mature us, he wants to make us stronger. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So keep that in mind. That's an encouragement. And remember also this. Jesus, when he was tempted, he was tempted three times in the wilderness. And at each temptation in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, that's one of the texts. In each temptation, what did he do? He came back with the word of God. Dear friends, you and I need to have that word of God. It's one good reason to memorize it, right? Uh, one good reason to have it handy, Jesus quoted scripture. Now the devil can quote scripture too, but he twists it and distorts it. Keep that in mind. But be ready with scripture. Jesus was hungry, right? Jesus, uh, the devil took advantage of that. He says, if you're the son of God, change these stones into loaves of bread. I'm sure there's nothing that Jesus would want more except doing the will of God than to have nice, fresh, hot bread there. But no, he says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Have the word of God ready. Let's be like Jesus. Use the word of God as our sword in temptations. But you know, once in a while we do fall into sin. 
okay? Once in a while we do mess up. And hopefully we feel bad about that. And you say, how did that happen? Well, we probably knew how it happened. You play with fire, as they say, you get burned. If you are too close to the edge, you eventually fall off. The fact is, we will sin. 1 John 1.9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, it was F.B. Meyer who said, I believe who once said these words about a brother or sister who fell into sin. There are two things we do not know. First, we do not know how hard he or she tried not to sin. So when we see a brother or a sister fall into sin, and I, I really look at this as the compassionate approach, uh, we don't know how hard they tried not to fall into sin. Second, we don't know the power of the forces that assailed him and her. We just don't know what they were dealing with, that power of temptation that assailed him and her. And thirdly, we do not know what we would have done in the same circumstances. We do not know what we have done in the same circumstances. So we don't agree with sin, but we're to have compassion when a brother or sister falls into sin and bring them back to Christ knowing that we can go to Christ and he forgives it all. He gives it a clean slate. 1 John 1, 9. You know, the devil would like us to believe you blew it now, forget it. You're all washed up with God. God doesn't want you anymore. You might as well end it all. Oh boy, how Satan would use that. The fact is we can come back to God, 1 John 1, 9, confess that sin and get right with God. Okay, just a brief review and we'll close. First of all, we're saying how to deal with temptation. Stay away from all evil company, we said. Very, very important. Live a life of prayer. Live a life of prayer. Oh, how we need that. Watch out for those thoughts. Keep your thoughts on good and godly things. Philippians 4, 8, right? Draw near, to God, draw near to God daily. Oh, he wants to draw near to us. But we must draw near to him daily in prayer and in the word. Realize that God will test us for our good, but God will never tempt us. Satan does that. We're to daily cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's do that daily in our life. Any darkness there, cast it off. Put on the armor of light. Don't love the world, but actively do the will of God. Don't love that world. Submit to God. Resist the devil and then flee. Be sober. Be sober. Be serious. Be vigilant. Be alert and resist the devil. We're also told to flee temptation. Flee temptation. Joseph did, as a good practice, just flee it. Give body and mind to God. Be of that living sacrifice and give our mind to God. That'll equip us. Come to Christ to help for mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you're going through it, go to Christ immediately. Go to the throne of grace. He was tempted like we were, he knows what it's all about. He will aid us. Also, we said hide and memorize God's word in our heart. Remember how important that is. Jesus used it all the time. We're being tested. Why? By God to build up our endurance, our perseverance, our maturity. When God allows that, it's for our good. Remember the words of Jesus. Come, learn, rest, give your burden to me. He wants us to do that. God will never give us more than we can handle. Keep that in mind. God is for us. God is for us. We have his promise. He's for us. As we said, use the word of God. And don't forget this. Don't leave any openings in your life where Satan can come in. Because if there's one opening, he'll find it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us talk about and gain insight in how to deal with temptation. Oh, how we need this, Lord, because we're surrounded by it. But, Lord, we know we can be victorious, joyous, happy Christians living the abundant life because you are for us. Lord, we just pray that you take these truths and just make them real in my life and those of her this morning. And, Father, may we be better equipped to be victorious Christians in the day in which we live. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand and sing 705.